Ahoy and welcome. I am Lee the Pirate Tester and welcome to the latest episode of Testing Tales. And today I am joined by Hillary. Welcome, Hillary. Thanks. Happy to be here. With this series, I like speaking with testers and learning about their journey, what they've been through, as well as, as any insights they wish to share. So first of all, Hillary, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? I am Hillary Weaver Rob. I'm a Geek lady all over the internet with threes instead of e's. Here's my uh, I have a little sticker stick here. There you go. I've been in testing. Uh, it'll be 15 years in November, actually. Um, very exciting. And I've done everything from quality analyst to quality lead to quality architect to back to quality engineer, which is what I'm doing today. And speaking at conferences all over the world, which is very fun and exciting. And I run the Motor City Software Testers user group. I had a look at your blog where it li where you've list like the talks you've done. The fact that I have to scroll <laughs> just says yeah. it all. I'm just like, wow, you put the amount of detail you like. It's, and generally, it's not like you've done it once and then it's gone it is you've had it in a lot of places but it's not like one talk done multiple times and that's your resume it is talk 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 online workshops talks in-person workshops you that's an impressive catalog thank you very much yes very much a jealous level <laughs> from <laughs> there. something for me to aspire to You've been in testing for 15 years this November, as you said, and you've done all sorts of different jobs with quality. How did you get from whatever you were in your previous non-quality life to becoming a tester? What was your journey in and then through all of this? I guess before 15 years ago, I was uh, going to school to be an art teacher. I had my associates in fine arts. I was going to be an art teacher. I was really excited. I started working as a production artist. Super excited to do like hands-on art. I was making art tiles, so working with ceramics and glaze and kilns and all of that fun stuff. And I realized that a lot of the people that I was working with had art education degrees and could not get jobs as art teachers. I had to rethink what I wanted to do because I could work here while paying off a lot more student loans, <laughs> like everyone else here. Or I could do something different. And I, you know, had a talk with myself. What what do I like to do? What do I want to do? And I've always liked computers, video games. Programming was interesting to me. I had a programming class for QBasic in high school. Um, so that was like, okay, you know, that that's pretty cool. I'm a nerd. I like that. I changed my major to computer science. And... After I got my Associates of Computer Science, the folks that ran the place where I was working were like, hey, instead of being a production artist, would you like to work on the website and also be like an, an associate gallery representative? So, you know, reach out to, to folks that carry our, our products and their galleries, but also work on a website. So I said, yes, great, let's do it. This is the first step in my software engineering journey. This is going to be amazing. So I was doing that for a while and started participating in like women in technology networking groups. So there was one okay. that was around me. They had a, a luncheon. And so I met up with them for lunch and just was hanging out and talking to this, this woman. And she was like, you know, you'd make a really good QA. And I was like, what's a QA? <laughs> Because I don't know. I was going to no school for computer does. science. I was going to school for computer science. They had never mentioned it once. Like testing was on the, the lowest thing. Like they never mentioned it. She explained to me and I was like, ah, I don't know. And she's like, well, we have an opening for an associate QA analyst at my company, uh, which is a software company. So, you know, think about it. So I was like, okay, you know, I'll think about it. And then I reached back out to her. I was like, this will be, you know, my opportunity to get my foot in the door. I could get into the software industry, become a, a programmer. You know, I'll write video games. Like, that was my my dream. I was working working on video games. She was like, great. I started my job there. She was my mentor, and she was amazing. She shared so many great things with me, like Elizabeth Hendrickson's um, heuristics cheat sheet, all kinds of great resources, and just kind of taught me how to do 
the job of, of a tester, basically. But also, you know, my experience with programming already and computer science and stuff already, and also my love of puzzles and just wanting to figure stuff out, like that kind of lended pretty well to it. Mm. There, I, you know, was promoted to QA lead because they liked, you know, what I was doing and how I was handling things and actually talking to developers and not just waiting for things to come over. I got that promotion. I was kind of in a place where it was, I wasn't a people manager. I was just like a, you know, process kind of manager. The people manager refused to do anything about the interpersonal issues that we had. So there was a, a person who was intentionally sabotaging test data. Wow. Because she wasn't happy with the fact that she got passed over for the promotion to the lead role. But then she also had said that she didn't want it. So it was it was very confusing. But he was like, so I was like, I need to find a different place to work. This isn't super supportive. So I found another place in their advertisement. It was like, do you like breaking the shit out of software? I was like, yes, this is great. I want to do this. So they were looking for a QA lead. So I went over there. And by the way, I was offered 40 grand more to stay from the company. Wow. It's like their counter offer. And I refused it. And they're like, that's not enough money for you. I was like, that's it's an insult. Money, it is but it's nice, nice, but it's not everything. Right. It could have, if you would have given it to me before, you know, it wouldn't be so insulting. So anyway, I left there and went to a startup, the most toxic environment I've ever oh, been no. in. It was horrendous. Like all of those things, like who would count test cases? Who would count bugs? This place. And even as a QA lead, uh, the CTO would come in and say, you guys don't know how to test. I'm going to show you how to test. Like, bro. <laughs> like, no. All sorts of other very toxic things going on there. So, after a couple of years, I... A I, couple of years? A couple of years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was bad. It was bad. <laughs> yeah, but it's so bad, I'm wondering why it was at the, even more than one year. I'm like, it's, it's a couple I, of years. So, it, it was like when you're in a really bad uh, relationship... <laughs> And you think you can make it better. It's not that bad. I can fix them. They That's, can change. They can change, yeah. But it just kept going downhill, downhill, downhill. In fact, I wrote an article for the testing club, Ministry of Testing back then, for the the, the book, or not the book, the, the newsletter. Mm -hmm. the, the paper, you know, newsletter that so like we the had. The testing times thing from the test well, yes, like yeah, a very yeah. long time ago. Yeah, so, because I had just, you know, was looking at the forums and all of those different resources that my mentor had given me, and I talked to, I think, Rosie Sherry. I was talking to her about testing stuff, and there was, what was the the app? It was like Flip, Flipagram? It wasn't Flipagram. It was something like that, that was had, like, she wanted me to, you know, curate some stuff for that. I was like, oh, this is really cool. I can do that. Maybe I can write an article about um, how not to be, you know, a shitty manager, basically. So I wrote an article for that. And, of course, I posted a link to it on my LinkedIn. And then the HR manager read it and was like, <laughs> this is all about your current management. And I didn't say in it. I ne There was nothing specific. But it was. They figured it out, so they weren't happy with me by the end. But I still, you know, left on on good terms, good enough terms, I guess. But pro tip: don't do that. Uh, if you write a article kind of slamming your current workplace, don't link it on your LinkedIn. I left there, um, and I I decided I didn't want to be a, a lead anymore. I I couldn't kind of handle that responsibility anymore. So I wanted to go back to being a quality engineer. So I joined. The last company that I was at, uh, and I was there for nine years. Um, so I started as a quality engineer, then a, an enterprise quality architect, then a solution quality architect, and then software engineer and test, uh, senior software engineer and test. And then they got rid of that title. So I was just senior software engineer uh, when I left that company. That was a whole, that's a whole journey in itself, but that's like kind of internal you know, kind of figuring out what my strengths were and talking to the right people. And I started speaking at conferences the year after I joined while I was still a quality engineer. 
And that kind of advocacy and then starting my meetup group got me to be noticed by enough people inside the company that they were like, you would be a great quality architect because you already have this kind of advocacy thing going on. You've got the community thing going on and all of that. That helped to that. And then <laughs> in March, I left that company and joined this new company as a senior quality engineer. So whew, it's been it's been a journey. <laughs> very long journey, but very, uh, lots of interesting projects and amazing people that I've worked with. And then speaking at conferences that has been, that's a whole other side of the career. That's just like really accelerated. I think the growth in my career and got me to meet so many people. And like, I, I met you at Test Bash Brighton, it right? It was Brighton, yeah. I think it was, what, 20? 20... 2019. Was it 19? I was thinking, was it 18, yeah. 19? No, 2019. The before times. When I spoke there. Yeah, yeah, the before times. But I spoke at Test Bash Brighton in 2019, and I met you and, like, so many other people that I had known from the internet or Slack or whatever, and, like, just amazing. And I met Rosie Sherry for the first time because um, <laughs> my, my previous company sent me to Star West, and she happened to be there in 2014. 2014. 2013 2013 oh my god <laughs> so long um so i got to meet rosie and like hang out with rosie and get a drink with rosie and get dinner with rosie like it was amazing it was so cool that just like someone that you know from the internet and then meeting them in person is just conferences are so cool for that i think yeah and it feels like to me at least your career progression and the conferences have kind of been intertwined. So the stuff you've learned in your job has let you do talks. And by doing all those talks, it helps you do internal movement. And it's very much uh, what they've built on each other. And it shows yeah. many benefits of talking at conferences. Yes, yes, for sure. So many. This feels like a fantastic segue into another thing we were planning to talk about. So uh, particularly on Twitter at the moment, conferences... Uh, being heavily talked about as a lot of people have unfortunately getting rejection letters for their conference talks, partly because a lot of people have been wanting to talk and the amount is like, I've read it's six to one ratio of people wanting to talk versus actually getting to talk. So they can all be the best speakers with the best pictures in the world, but you could only take a sixth of them. So that's a right. lot of disappointed people. Yeah, and I'm I'm one of them. Uh, I count myself among them. I had uh, three conference rejections so far this year, and I've got a couple more that I'm I'm hoping I'll get in because I have a goal of doing a new talk at a conference this year. Like I've I've done you know five or this is my sixth uh, appearance, remote meetups mostly, and then you know these video podcast kind of things. But you know that's a goal. So it is it's a bummer to get rejected, but. I've also been on the other side of that. So I was the testing track chair for the Code Mash conference for four or five years, I think. Mm -hmm. So you review all of the submissions that come in for your category. You, you know, have to kind of rate them and see which ones are great, which ones are not so great, which ones are just like a single sentence abstract, which is not going to get you speaking. Don't submit them. <laughs> please. I don't care who you are. If you give me just one sentence, it's it's not enough for me. Maybe Angie Jones could do that one sentence thing because I know Angie will deliver no matter what, but anybody else? No. Um, so, but especially if it's like, you know, blind, you don't know who it is that's submitting, then it's, yeah, yeah don't, don't give me one sentence. But then you have to kind of stack rank those and then you have, okay, you have this many slots. Who do you want to fill in? And, you know, we can maybe give or take one or two from this other category. But when you have thousands of people submitting, it is so hard. And I know a lot of the people that, along with me, were rejected, had great ideas, great concepts that they want to get. But also the people that were selected were really great concepts and really great people. It's like, yeah. it's, it is, it's a tough thing, but it's also... I have learned to just take that as, okay, I need to either work on that abstract, depending on what the, the feedback is that comes back, if there is any, 
you know, maybe modify the abstract, modify my idea a little bit, make sure I know, you know, how it's going to fit in with the conference and um, how to make it a little bit more unique and not just like something that's, you know, API testing. It's like, here is a specific corner of API testing that I find really interesting and that I can make fun, you know? Yes. Yeah. Because if it's just like another boring API testing talk, like no one's going to want that. So. And, that, and that's the thing. I imagine if you go with like when talks being selected, like, well, we can't have all 10 talks today about API. And like, unless it's an API conference, you're like, right. we, we've we got other themes. Like you could all be really good. We don't need you all talking about the same thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's a tough business. So I, I definitely uh, and uh, Test Bash Detroit, which was supposed to happen in March of 2020. <laughs> sad, sad, sad. Um, or April of 2020. I think it was April. That, you know, was heartbreaking to have to cancel that. But we went through so many sub great submissions, just amazing submissions. But you it's a one day conference you know, with the day before of workshops, but it's a one day conference. So you and you single track have, for people who've not been to those kind of things as well. Yeah, single track. So you have eight, maybe nine talks. Like it is so tough to get like the just uh, filtering that out. It is so hard. So I it sucks to be rejected, but also it's a learning opportunity. You know, it's it helps you pick yourself back up because it sucks to fail but that's that's another thing it's like it's it's a learning thing and it's also something to kind of make you stronger because mm -hmm. submitting to 10 conferences in a year you might get accepted to all of them you might get accepted to none of them I, that's happened to me <laughs> it'll happen to anybody else like i've you know no matter how many times i've spoken at conferences and you know definitely other people have spoken way way more than me it's it still stings, but you know, it happens. I imagine <laughs> if you were successful to ten conferences a year, you'd be exhausted. <laughs> I yeah, I had that, and they were all like within the same. You know, it was like six weeks between September and October that was just like travel, 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 travel. It was just constant, and it was exhausting. It was super exhausting. Like I. Yeah, I'm never doing that again. Because <laughs> you're like, I'll probably get rejected from at least one of these, so I'll have some time in between. But yeah, no. Well, conversely, if you are successful, you'd be like, yeah, actually, uh, I can't do it. Why? Because I'm going to collapse. <laughs> yeah, because too many of you like me. Stop. <laughs> yeah. Be more spread out. Yes. Yes. Spread out. Jeez. But I do speak at both developer conferences and testing conferences. So that kind of broadens my range a little bit, which I think is something if you're a testing speaker and you've only spoken at testing conferences, broaden your horizons because, you know, a lot of our topics apply to developer conferences and a lot of testers will attend developer conferences and have like no content. <laughs> so look for those. Like Codemash is a great one. It's a, it's got a huge range of topics from and there is a testing category but there's so many other categories too that you'll get a, a wide range of people in there it's really cool. say i i know i'd love to attend some more it but not testing conferences one so we can get in more an idea of what they're like but also if quality does come up be like right what are all these people saying about it how do they interpret it because if they yeah. suddenly go, yeah, testers are terrible people and they just slow us down, I would just be there at the end and be like, uh, excuse me, what? No. So the actual first, the journey into speaking was I was attending a .NET user group because I was working in an application that was .NET. They wanted me to write some, um, I had inherited some automation code that was in .NET. I didn't learn anything about .NET really in college. So I was like you know, C++, but it wasn't, uh, I don't know, that was the, that was the closest. <laughs> it was terrible. So I was attending this user group and I kind of felt like, you know, the, the spy among us kind of thing. Like I'm just overhearing <laughs> how they're dealing with things and, and whatever. And I just, I decided to do a lightning talk. They did, you know, five to 10 minute talks before the main speaker. 
and I decided to do one that turned into the talk that I, I have given at several developer conferences called your QA should be your BFF. And it is really like, here's all of the things that a tester, a QA, whatever you want to call them can help you with. We should be friends. We should not be foes. And I evolved that talk after working at the, the next company that I was working at because the uh, software architect was joining our team, like our project team. And, you know, one of the developers was walking around and, and introducing people and he introduced me and said, and this is our QA, Hillary. And he groaned audibly. Like he wasn't, it was uncontrollable, just like, uh, QA. Like that's, that's just his entire career. He's just like, ugh, QA. So we are now friends. We are now friends because he is like, you know, after, after that, he, you know, learned who I was. Uh, the other developers on the team were like, no, 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 she's good. She's good QA. <laughs> just, you know, she's good. Trust us. She's good. But that evolved that talk. Like I learned more things about what his prejudices were, why he thought, you know, QA isn't good or whatever. And what made me a good QA compared to the people that, that he had worked with before. And then he's, he's also written a, a blog post about it and like how, you know, QA should be your BFF. Like he's, he's on my side Yay. now, so it's great. It's like I've converted. <laughs> but also going to those developer conferences and stuff, you, you get more empathy for the developers, the stuff that they're working through, but you're also getting more on the same playing field as them. So it's easier to build rapport with them. Um, mm -hmm. that is something that I had to learn, you know, from the beginning was like the, the first meeting that I went in, it was like, I found a bug. Ha ha. I was like super excited. And everybody was just like, <laughs> I was like, oh, I guess that's not a good thing to be like, yes, we're excited about. So I had to kind of change, you know, have some tact, <laughs> learn, learn how to, you know, deal with with that whole thing and then you know people started to like me and started to respect me and started to ask me for my opinion and ask me to test something before they got a chance to you know before it got put into the testing environment whatever so yeah it it's it's been a journey i don't even know where i started with this or where my goal was but this is where we are <laughs> i mean i had a similar conversation with some devs as i recently left my place uh, my last place and they were saying, like, initially, they're like, oh, God, Lee's so annoying. And then after a week or so, they're like, he's making a really good point. He actually knows what he's on about. I'm like, I mean, yeah, I'm not doing it to antagonize you all. I'm doing it to understand things. I ask these annoying questions because then if they go, we can't answer this. They're like, OK, that's a different problem, because if we don't know the answer, do we know what we're doing? Do we know why we're doing it? And so forth. And like I've had BAs go on, yeah, the way you would ask questions made me go, oh, we hadn't considered these things. And it, it made them up their game. It's just, as you say, it's how we approach it. Not just, ha you failed. It's, yeah, this doesn't seem right. Can we talk about it? Um, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's actually, I have a couple of stories on that. There was a developer that I, or a couple of developers that I've worked with before uh, in my last team that, you know, as they're, you know, in stand-up, they're giving their status and, and whatever. And they're like, well, and I'm going to test a few more things uh, that Hillary would test before I give it to her. Um, because I know, you know, she'll, she'll test these things. So I want to check before she gets it. It's like, yes. Yes. They're learning. They're changing. They're learning. <laughs> they can learn too. <laughs> but also... When I joined this new company, I came with so many questions, so like no assumptions, tons of questions, and I found a huge bug in production. And it was like, everybody's like on it right away, fix it super quick, like no question. But the after effects from that have been like the CEO, the CTO, the, you know, whatever, all of these people are saying, Hillary did a great job finding this thing. Make sure you you test these kinds of scenarios and also question your assumptions. People thought that this thing just since it worked last time, it's going to work this time because no one touched that specific area. But it turns out some maintenance that was done on the Ooh. server that it lived on or whatever changed something. And so I just was like, hmm, I'm just testing and oh shit. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> this is bad. 
And so I reach out to people, hey, this is, I just found this thing. And they're like, oh, talk to these people. Hey, I just found this thing. Okay, we're going into like, I'm like, I've been here for a week and a half. What can I do? <laughs> can I, how can I help you? But that's like the importance of just, you know, leaving those assumptions at the door and asking questions. And yes, we will change the behaviors of other people on the team to not just kind of assume that they know what they're doing or assume no one else has questions when everybody has questions, but no one's brave enough to raise their hand. Just, you know, I raise my hand as a tester. I need to know how X, Y, and Z work. Can you explain that to me? Do we have process flow diagrams? No. Does anyone know how this work? How this works? Well, this is how it works. No, it should work like this. It's like, okay, great. We're having a conversation. Let's keep <laughs> this going. Like we're all learning how this should work. I had it where because of my love of data in SQL, when I came in, it was like, okay, we need to do some stuff. I'm like, cool. Have we got data models for how all the tables connect? So they're like, no. I'm like, what do you mean, no? How do you not know how all your tables are connected? That's terrifying. They were like, yeah, and it'd be too much effort to build them all. I'm like, that's not a good answer. No. Is it, yeah, it's too much effort. But then, you know, if you have an outage... If you have, you know, some disaster recovery scenario, who's going to fix it? How are they going to fix it? Oh, that person's on vacation or they left the company and they're the one that knew everything. <laughs> That's bad. Oopsie. <laughs> yeah. Oops. It's the bus factor. I don't like the bus factor. I like calling it the lottery factor. Like someone won the lottery and they left and they, they're never working again in their life. Not that they got hit by a bus. Like that's. Yeah. Just... <laughs> I think it's, I know Lisa Crispin's a fan of calling it the lottery theory rather than the bus theory, isn't she? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd like to thank everyone for watching. This has been a very interesting talk with Hillary and there's, it's been so good and it's going to be a nightmare to edit this because it's just all good. Apart from the bits you won't see, which will be edited out. <laughs> uh, so Hillary, if you'd like to remind people where they could find you on the internet, please. So I am... Geek Lady everywhere. So it's G33K Lady. Um, on Twitter, my website is geeklady.com. On uh, the Ministry of Testing Slack, Geek Lady. Um, so yeah, find me there. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for wanting to speak with me today. Uh, it's also just been good seeing you because, after you said, it's been since 2019 we've properly spoken. So, yeah, it's just nice to start catching up with people again. Even if it's not in 3D, it's some, It's more than just words on Twitter. Yes, yeah, for sure. Thank you, everyone, and tune in next time for more Testing Tales. Goodbye. <laughs>